Um, I'd like to uh, take, let's take God's Word. And as we take God's Word, whether it be in the pew or on your uh, iPad or your cellular phone, whatever you're looking at your Bible, just repeat after me. This is God's Word. This is God's Word. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. And I can do what it says I can do. And I can do what it says I can do. I am protected. I am empowered. I am empowered. And I am redeemed. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, uh, this morning the devil would like to uh, take our mind elsewhere and take it off the Word of God uh, this morning because the Word of God can really take root in your, your minds and hearts and change your life forever. We've been in a, a series called The Blessed Life and we've been talking about the right attitude, the right heart, and, and, and manners of, in which we give. We talked last Sunday about uh, the spirit of mammon, what mammon is, and how to break that spirit. We learned that mammon was riches, and that, that riches, possessions, things that can, can cloud our minds and so forth. And I think we've got an awesome story here in John chapter 12 today that's going to continue that into uh, in, in our series that we've titled Am I Generous? Am I Generous? And you really got to make that a personal question. Am I Generous? Evaluate your Monday through to, to this morning. Look at the ways in which you live. Were you generous? And a lot of people want to immediately go towards money. Don't, don't go that way. Were you generous in everything that you did. Time, words, possessions. Were you generous? John chapter 12, looking at verses 1 through 6. I think we have uh, an appointment with God this morning. You know we make appointments up every week. We make appointments with our friends, don't we? We make appointments with doctors. We make appointments at school, we, we make uh, appointments, extracurricular activities, and stuff like that. Why can't we have an appointment with God this morning? Can we agree with that? Can we have an appointment with God? Okay. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has ra had raised from the dead. That, to me, is an awesome gathering. You know, the dead guy raised up and never raised around. Uh, verse 2. Here, here the dinner was given in Jesus' arm. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped uh, his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? On the surface of things, me and you would agree with that statement. Why wouldn't it be sold and given to the poor? We have plenty of poor, they need it, right? Why wasn't it given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And back then, a lot of people worked per day and got paid per day. Some of you get paid per month, or per per week, per two weeks, once a month, and so forth. They got paid every day. So this was a year's wages. He did not say this. Now verse 6 tells us Jesus' heart. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money back. He used to help himself to what was put into it. How could be? Now see, when I read this, I have two questions that comes to mind. Why would Mary give such an extravagant <laughs> gift? I mean, we're here, right? Let's just say a lady runs through the double doors and sits down at someone's feet and takes what we all know to be an expensive uh, oil, uh, perfume or something and with, with it anoints the feet and dries it with her hair. Be totally weird 
for first off, but totally surprising, right? And the fragrance would fill this room, and you know, some of us we, we wouldn't know how to paint it. Why did she do that? That's my question when I read this. Why did she do that? And secondly, why would it get Judas so upset? If he didn't care about the poor, why would it get Judas so upset? In fact, why do people today do extravagant things for God and others sit back and get upset at that? You know, oftentimes you might hear this. You might hear this experience right here in modern day terms. You might hear something on Fox News, on Facebook, on the media, on TV, whatever. You might have heard someone doing something extravagant for someone else. And you might catch yourself or others, you know, because we all have comments on Facebook, judging that, speculating, and, and throwing, throwing accusations and assumptions out there. And so we do the same thing Jews did. We talk about other people's extravagant giving without understanding the why. And I think we ought to notice there's two hearts displayed here today. Say two hearts. There are two hearts displayed here today. The first heart being one of generosity and the second heart being one of selfishness. And one, I, I got, uh, I have a hard time retaining things, so that's why I put pen to paper, I write things down, I type in, and I read it, and stuff like this, but there's one thing that helps me remember this. Generosity starts with the letter God. Yeah, G for God, right? Uh, selfishness starts with S, right? Same. So to me, Generosity is all about God, and selfishness, to me, is all about Satan. Satan was selfish from the beginning. It's how Satan became Satan. I will, I will, uh, um, I'm paraphrasing here for, not, for lack of the exact words, but I will, I will put myself on God's throne and be the most, I will be the most high. And then at that moment of selfishness, God he became, he, uh, God cast him out of heaven. He became uh, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, to what we know him to be. It was a simple act of selfishness, rebellious heart, and so forth, all that combined. So let me tell you some things about generosity, okay? If you have your bulletins, I like pen to paper. If you could write this down, point number one out of John 12, we see the enemy of generosity is selfishness. The enemy of generosity is selfishness. And I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, and it's worth repeating a dozen more times before the year ends, but we're all born selfish. We're all born with this selfish attitude that we have to rid ourselves of. And it starts at a young age. I mean, let's face it. When we're born, we cry when we're hungry. We're, we cry when we're wet and need a diaper change. We cry when we're not being healed. We're, we cry a lot. We cry when we're not feeling good. All that, of course, is to get mom and dad's attention so we can provide the care necessary. But let me, let, let's go a little bit further. We carry that into our young childhood when we start playing with toys and going to the stores, what, what, what our kids do, they, they start wanting this and wanting that, and it's all about them, and then they, they then all of a sudden they come to an age where they can have friends over, right? And, and then the first thing that they do, uh, little Johnny starts seeing Bobby play with his favorite toy. And, and, and that's fighting words. I mean, game on. And then all of a sudden, at the, you know, you're enjoying your company, Bobby's parents and stuff, and you're Johnny's parents. You're all enjoying stuff, coffee at the living room, and all of a sudden, Mommy! That's what you hear, Mommy! And then all of a sudden, the ruckus happens. You come in there and find out that Johnny ain't sharing with Bobby. And you got to teach them how to share. Because they're born selfish. And if that's not dealt with at an early age on through, that will stick to you like a gorilla glue. I'm telling you, it'll, you'll continue being selfish with what's yours. 
you will continue doing that. And you know, they, the, the kids, they, they always like, one of the things that Job, Job does to me and all my kids did to me all the time, you know, and they do it to you. Now, if we're in church, we're all telling the truth here. One of the kids that really gets my dander up, I'll tell you, is when Job will come up to me and say, God's been nice having so his house, and everybody's standing around, and I'm on the spot, and I'm talking about something else. What? God's been something nice having so his house, it's all about him. And what I'm trying to do is teach him, do not ask me to spend the night at somebody's house on the spot in front of everybody because I'm telling you, they're smart. They've got this in their back of their head. And they, and they know that if they get you quickly to say yes, they got it. They're in. You can't back out now. And so they're in there. It's good. So I'm trying to teach them, hey, let's do this the right way. Let's ask at an appropriate time and, and we can figure this thing out. Because, you know, I'm talking to people and we're talking. we got a lot of things going on as a church. We've got a lot of things going on in, in our own lives and stuff. We've got to talk this out. He don't, he's not thinking about those things, right? It's selfish. It's selfish. We've got to deal with it. So, um... We have to deal with this selfishness. This is an interesting story. It's Judas, the thief. He makes the statement, why was it this sold and given to the poor? Uh, and we, we make the same statement as we look around and perceive the extravagant living of others. You know the definition of extravagant is anyone who has more than you. That's extravagant. Anybody who has more than you. And we say things like, now that's an extravagant neighborhood. You can, you can drive through a nice neighborhood, I, you know, patrolling in, in, in Harrison County. They've got some nice developments out there. You, you see some nice places out there. Uh, but here's, here's where I'm going with that. What I want you to understand, the Grand Canyon is extravagant to visit, right? But when I live right beside of the Grand Canyon, the extravagant starts going away because now I've become used to it. So the neighborhoods that I drive through, the houses I see, the things I see that I would consider extravagant, once I have them, once I live beside them or in them, they're no longer extravagant. And my challenge to you this morning is, do we not take God's most extravagant gift and because we have it, we don't consider it extravagant anymore. We're used to it. Salvation is just one of those things. We never stop to yeah, Christ died upon the cross. Yes, this December we'll celebrate the birth of Christ and the reasons why and we'll Advent leading up to and doing all that. This is this is extravagant stuff we're talking about. And then, you know, Easter coming around, that's extravagant and stuff. If God gave His one and only Son, that's an extravagant gift. Yet, yet, it can become mundane. Just another holiday. It might not be extravagant anymore. So as long as the devil has our focus on other people's stuff and he's we spend less time looking upon ourselves, you know. We, uh, what extravagant gift have, have you been given? While we're paying attention to the extravagance of others around us, what, what extravagant gifts have you been given? I know every one of us has been given an extravagant gift, according to John 3.16. So we know that Judas took care of the offering box, right? The Bible said that, right? And people and, and uh, people gave to Jesus and his disciples. Here's an amazing question: Who put G, who put G, Judas in charge of the money box? Or in other words, who's in charge of this bunch of people? Do you think Jesus knew G, uh, Judas was a thief when he gave him the money box? Yeah, because two years before this very event right here, Jesus said, did I not choose the twelve whom, whom one of you is, is the devil? Jesus chose these twelve. And Judas had the money box. Jesus 
understand what was going on. So it begs the question, why would Jesus do this? Jesus did not choose Judas so he could fail. He chose Judas to see if he would pass the test. God will test us in things, not tempt us. God tempts no one, but God will test us in areas of our resources. You want to say mine? No, that's mine. You want to be greedy? You want to be selfish with what you have? That is a test. Not a temptation, a test. And if God, uh, the Bible says when you plant sparingly, you will reap sparingly. When you find yourself in need, how many needs did you meet? God will test us in things like this. God tests us every week, every couple weeks, every month, depending upon when you get a paycheck. Do you honor God with the first fruits of your increase, or do you honor Visa? I've already shared with you some testimonies where people in the church, our church here, has already shared testimonies that they've been blessed because they decided to put God first. Regardless of how churches take up their offerings, there is no one that I know of here that would take money out of the offering. But if you, the person who keeps money in your account, which God has told you to tithe, wouldn't that be the same thing? Point number two. The extravagance of generosity the extravagance of generosity. The reason I use this word extravagance is because God is a generous God and our God gave the extravagant gift. And there are several examples in the Bible of an extravagant gift. I mean, I can see Abraham giving everything. When he came across Melchizedek and he, he gave. It's like when you come across God's people where, where uh, uh, unrighteous mammon riches, possessions, when those things don't have them, when they don't control that person and they're, they're a Christian, you see Christians just meeting needs left and right. And that is an awesome thing to see. Uh, King David, what he gave, uh, what he gave in his time, if compared to our currency today, we're total in the billions. And that's extravagant. A lot of people don't think this was extravagant, but Jesus said it was extravagant. The, wood, the widow woman, who, like we take up our offering when uh, you put the offering in the offering envelope, and as you leave, uh, you put your offering in the offering plate. I believe, for this reason right here, when Jesus was standing up near the offering plate, at least where you could see it, people were coming up and giving up their offering and going. Well, this widow woman came up and gave her two mites. Remember that story? This was extravagant for this woman. Because it was all she had. And Jesus looks at this extravagant attitude in this heart and says, she gave more than anybody else did. Why do you say that? Not because of the physical uh, might that she had, because of the attitude and the heart that she had. Because Jesus could care less about the coins. It was the heart and attitude that she gave and released it. You see, sometimes people, it'd be like, uh, you know, the offering, if, if the offering plate was passed around, you know, people like have strings to it. You put it in, you jerk it right back out. You know, or you put it in and, and uh, you know, you want to kind of tell what happens with it and all this stuff. But the widow woman gave two mites. It's not the amount that you give that makes the, the gift extravagant. It's the attitude behind the gift in both of those examples. Mary gave 300 denarii, um, denarii, which is the plural of denarius. Denarius means a day's wages. And a day's wage is a lot different than, than it was 80 years ago. Gas prices are a lot different today than what they were then, 80 years ago. Would you agree? 
So whatever your salary is for a year, for you to give that in one lump sum, would that be an extravagant gift? Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you something else. Would anointing oil that costs as much as a year's wage be poured out upon someone's feet, would that be extravagant? Yes, because that's exactly what she did. Could you give a gift to God that would impress him? I'm talking about an amount now in God who owns everything. I don't care if you pull, pull a million dollars out of your pocket right now and put that in the offering plate. If you did it because you wanted to impress God with your giving, wrong heart, wrong attitude, doesn't matter. You get, God, it's not about what you, what you give. It's about how you give. That's what this whole series is about. It's how you give. Because if the love of money is the root of all evil, not some, not a little bit, but if the love of money is the root of all evil, then we Christians, we as the churches, in the community, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about this. Let us be a church that God has it and, and, and money don't have us. Amen? Second Corinthians 8, 5. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And then by the will of God also to us. You see, to live a blessed life, you first have to give yourself. And the Bible says, every time a soul comes to God and repents and is saved, heaven is in celebration. And so, to have a blessed life, your first step is making the Lord the Lord making Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. That's the first step to have a blessed life. The, the next steps after that is a journey that, that you allow God to be Lord over everything else. Lord over your attitude. Lord over your, your mind, your heart. Uh, Lord over your wallet, your checkbook, your bank account. Lord over your vehicles, your houses, your job. Lord over your friends, the Lord over your entertainment that you watch and see, what goes into your ears. You know the Bible says that the, your, your eyes are the windows to your soul. So, so if you do not let the Lord become Lord over what goes into your eyes and stuff, then, then you're doing it wrong. He's got, he's got to be Lord. And that includes our, our pocketbook. Again, it's not the amount, but it's the attitude in which we give that makes the gift extravagant. Um, don't and, and, and it really bothers me. Don't tell me God has your heart if He doesn't have your money. Because Jesus says, "Where your treasure is, there will your heart also be." So if your treasure is God, then great. But if if, if your treasure is money, then guess what? God don't have your heart. Your treasure does. And we learned last Sunday that you cannot serve both. It's so clear, black and white, red letter. Jesus said it, you cannot serve both God and man. You either love the one and hate the other, or serve the one and reject the other. You can't do both. You can't do both. To me, there are three levels of giving in the Bible. First of all, the first level of giving is God. That's the first discipline and expected discipline of time. You give the Lord the time. And then, like Pastor Rick said in the announcements and stuff, we're in this campaign. I don't take my tithe, which goes to a general fund that keeps the lights on, keeps the heat on, keeps the snow removed from the parking lot, puts down, uh, you know, I don't, I don't take that tithe and I don't put it to, to something else. Because it takes X amount of dollars to keep the lights on in a year. A church creates a budget, and if I if I decide, if, if everybody decided to give their tithe somewhere else to something else and still call it your tithe, then then the, then we'll get the shut off notice. You understand what I mean? 
we, it's got to be a destiny. God said, bring me the first fruit. So you bring it into the house of God, then it gets redistributed out, right? It pays the bills. Now, when it comes to forward in faith, going that above and beyond, we are asking, that's an offering. That is an offering. I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's $5. I don't care if it's $60. But it's above and beyond the time. And it goes directly to that specific. <coughs> and then there's almsgiving, which is extravagant. See, offerings and almsgiving, look it up in the Bible. Tithes, offerings, and alms. Look it up in the Bible. Do a word search. And you'll find that both offerings and alms are extravagant giving. It's above what's expected. God gives you the 90, you give him the 10, right? That's, that's, that's a done deal in my heart. But then there's that offer. I just attended a, a, a prayer conference on Friday night where they took up an offer. I could have sat back and said, oh no, no, I already gave my tithe to the church. Hey, that's what I did. Any dollars that I gave to that was extravagant. It's above and beyond. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of Christians don't even make it past the first. See, we've heard a lot about tithes. We don't hear much about offerings. We don't hear much about alms. But the devil's really got the church all wrapped up like a yarn ball uh, when it comes to tithes. We can't even get past the first level to even think about the second and third levels. We have trouble with the first level. And I think that's the devil's uh, goal. Statistics say that only 5 to 7 percent of Christians in the, in the United States actually tithe regularly. So that leaves your 93 to 95 percent of Christians never grow past that first level. They never understand it. They never really take control of that check. They never really let God be Lord over it. I'm telling you right now, I mean, uh, I mean, there needs to, I know there, there's been some services or some churches told people, bring your checkbooks up here, bring your wallets up here, and lay it on the altar, and we're going to anoint every bit of it. And that's how serious they were about really letting the Lord be Lord over your check. And it was not about the church building crystal steeples. It was about a church allowing the Lord to be Lord over their finances. Because... If once we start letting the Lord be Lord over our finances, God will bless our mess. He will take our mess and then move it into an area where it's starting to be blessed. And you're going to start to see funds come your way that, that, that you never expected. You never expected. The last point I want to make to you is the reward. The reward of generosity. Now this is a story we read in John 12. It's also in Matthew and Mark. In Mark, in, uh, Mark 14, verse 9, it says, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. <coughs> Notice I said the reward of generosity. This ain't no ordinary book. What do you say? The Word of God is still the best-selling book. Right? And because of this woman's generosity, her story is told for years, forever, in the Word of God. And I know, I, I know I'm not telling you to do something extravagant for God so your so your story can be told. Right? What I'm telling you is is that God will honor you in ways you don't even know because you have a right heart and right attitude to give and be generous. And not only not only the expected tithe, but you 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 
gotten to the second level of offering and given above and beyond because you believe that your church is supporting missionary work. You believe your church, like, hey, it's helping hands ministry. Right? Today, it is going to go out and it's going to help an elderly lady who needs some things done to her home. And you know what? She don't have to pay a thing. And you know why? Because you guys gave. And she can have peace of mind because she cannot physically do anything for herself. She's going to have peace of mind that these things are taken care of and that things are done. And, and, and she don't have to pay a dime because God provided her. And we're also going to a school. And if you knew the inner workings of the Board of Education and how long it takes them to redo, fix, update anything in the school buildings that's falling apart. We're going, to get, we're going to a school and we're going to paint a small portion of a gymnasium so, so kids can have a better representation of their school when they have sporting events in that gymnasium. You know how long they've been waiting to have that done? Probably about 10 months. And a handful of us are going to go up there and we're going to do it. You know what that is? That's not Isaac or you giving your times to make that happen. That's, that's the offering and the alms part. That's the extravagant part where we're going to go and we're going to put God's name in there as doing something for God in his, in his honor. And you know what? They have a hard time getting the parents of the school together to do something like that. So guess whose name is glorified? God's name is glorified through the church. Most of us would go to our graves happy to know the community in which we live speak of the generosity which has been sown into it. And that's what Hagen's Helping Hands Ministry is. You know who Hagen's Helping Hands Ministry is also contemplating the and discussing the Hagen Cemetery. Taking care of it. And we, we've already discussed some ideas on how to do that. People get all wrapped up over their uh, over this and that and stuff and they get all busy and stuff and we, we leave things behind. I mean, things get forgotten though and about. The definition of generosity today, if you can hear me, is you give expecting nothing in return. The definition of selfishness is you give and now you think God owes you something. <coughs> now you sit there and you say, well that's not me. Now you keep in mind of something. I don't care if you've been going here for 50 years and I don't care how much you've been donating to the church and what you did. But if it ever comes out of your mouth, after all I did, you mean the church is going to do this? Then you fit in that category where you give and now you think God owes you something. That's the category you fit. I would be weary of those thoughts. I would be repentant of those thoughts. <coughs> Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. you got to ask yourself the question, Am I generous? Am I generous? With your words, with your resources, with your time. Dear Bruce Heavenly Fathers, we've come into your house this morning. We've talked about the generosity just in brief, or we just scratched the surface of some stories. Lord, we ask you to give us a generous heart. Give us a generous mind. Lord God, let us have the heart of that widow lady. Let us have the heart of the woman that knelt down. And in disregard of the value of the, of the substance she put upon Jesus' feet, 
Let us have that same heart. Let us give it, not letting the left hand knows, know what the right hand is doing. Let us not contemplate. And let us just do. Today, Lord God, I ask you to bless everyone here. Bless their hands, bless their minds, bless their hearts. Whatever they find it to do and think about, Lord God. Let them ask of you, how can they be generous? Let them draw closer to you this morning. Through your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.